Restaurant Unstoppable. What the most successful restaurateurs know that you don't. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Matthew Jennings. My man, Matt, are you feeling unstoppable are you? today? I'm always. great, man. Good, good. Yes. I'm always feeling unstoppable. Dude, you've been so. on my radar for a while. I'm so happy to be here, to be sharing your story. I can't wait to get into it. So just real quick, uh, you got your start in and tuck it right. You're a graduate of the New England Culinary Institute of America. New England Culinary, is that what it goes by? New England uh, Culinary Institute. Not of America. Not of America. Like that's a different on the, one. The that's, other one. In, that's uh, yeah, the Hyde other Park. one. The <laughs> other one. Yeah. Uh, see, you you opened your first restaurant in 2003, uh, the the Farmstead, correct? Farmstead, uh, yeah. Providence, Rhode Island, and then 2015, 10 years later, you opened Townsman in Boston, Massachusetts, your hometown, and now you're out here in Vermont. I cannot wait to dive into your story, but let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Well, there's so many uh, that I love, but um, I would say, you know, we used to have a saying at uh, my last restaurant in Boston, Townsman, which was head down, heart strong. Ooh. And I really love it. It's meant to represent keeping your head down and moving forward and getting your work done um, and being productive, but doing it with a full heart and doing it with, um, you know, best intentions in mind and your team always in mind. So what is a what is a full heart? Well, I mean, for me, it's it's trying to uh, operate from a place of empathy, right? Always putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, always trying to be considerate of your team, your environment. Um, so, yeah. I love it, man. Yeah. Great way to get this thing started. Yeah. So, where does it make sense to start telling your story? I know you were working in Nantucket as a teenager. I'm curious how a teenager finds himself in Nantucket. Uh, did you have family there? Yeah, so I, I grew up... Um, uh, my in the Boston area from Boston originally and my mother's uh second husband um my stepfather had uh, a place out on Nantucket his his family had a, a, a little kind of fishing shack down in Syasconset which is the easternmost point of the island kind of before it all became the Botox borough that it is now <laughs> Um, before it had really kind of gone crazy uh, with the influx of a lot of uh, a lot of folks from out of town, and so I kind of at a very young age just kind of grew up uh, out there and in the beach community and um, spending summers uh, there with my family and uh, kind of decided to take my first job at a little local grocery store in okay. town there. Now yeah. you 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 from what i could gather you kind of fell in love with food the act of getting your food at a young age and, and you is that like what what is it exactly about this industry and food that drew you to it yeah i mean i i grew up in a family that celebrated food um i was lucky that way my my father is a landscape architect and urban designer and so had always been into creating gardens and gardening a lot at home did you have anything to do with your yard well, welcome. Yeah, so you, we're we're sitting uh, on the farm right now, and and uh, yeah, right. Um, which has it, you shouldn't pan around too much because it needs a lot of love. I'll take you down. I'll take you down to the to the garden. Uh, you know, after this, but he's how he's certainly been an influence here. But he, but he, I grew up with him, always creating gardens uh, wherever we lived. Um, and my mom uh, is just an amazing cook, and so you know she was always kind of had a pot going or was making chicken soup or, you know, just real simple kind of classic, you know, uh, homemade meals. Um, so I grew up with kind of a love for food, always being around. Um, and then after trying my hand at some, some, you know, other things and, and the attempts at a liberal arts education, which didn't really pan out for various reasons, uh, it was just decided that I'd give food a shot. So um, that's kind of how it started. And, and my first, uh, you know, foray into that was this little grocery store. Um, and the owner of that grocery store had an adjacent cafe. And so I was like a stock boy. You know, I was probably like 14, stocking shelves, full newspapers on Sundays, that sort of thing. Um, but I was, I was always looking in the cafe door. You know, I'd kind of finish up my shifts and I'd walk out and I'd walk by the cafe and look in the back kitchen door and be like, man, how do I get in there? Like, those guys look cool. There's like fire, there's knives, there's, you know, exciting. Riff raff. <laughs> yeah, riff raff, exciting things happening. Uh, you know, they all kind of look like a bunch of pirates out on their smoke break behind the restaurant, right? Yeah. And like, so I was like, this is very interesting. Something about this is very cool. Um, and so I kept asking him, hey, how do I get in there? How do I get in there? He's like, ah, oh, you're not ready. You're too young. Eventually, maybe someday. 
and I just stuck with that gig. And How old are you at this time? 14, okay. probably. Yeah. yeah, 13, 14. And then, uh, a f- you know, two years later, um, uh, two seasons later, he said, you know, you want to give your uh, shot at prep? And I said, yeah. So he started me at prep and, uh, you know, I was making stocks and, you know, peeling vegetables and taking the trash out and filling the, you know, cooks like quart containers with Pepsi and, you know, all those things that, that a young prep cook does. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it. You know, it really kind of the, the food bug bit me, I yeah. think, at that point. Um, so what, what aside from the food, I mean, obviously food is a big part of the romance in working in kitchens and restaurants. But what else did you fall in love with or in? Well, I fell in love with the whole culture. I think I think like I've always had a really great work ethic. I love to work. Um, I think that that was instilled by my parents. Um, I loved and appreciated and still do to this day the fact that, you know, kitchens, restaurants, food service operations, they're places where you can go in and you can really work hard and you get to see the fruits of those la- that labor at the end of the day. You know, you walk away and you can look back on a product that you've created that you've had your hands in. Like that's very fulfilling for yeah. me, you know? And so I think that piece of it, kind of that trade or that craft of it was like really interesting to me. Okay. So when did you say to yourself, all right, this is what I want to do. This is where I'm going to start being intentional. I want to start climbing the ladder, working at better and better restaurants. I'm going to go to school for this. Like when did you know that was going to happen? Well, so after a number of, of uh, seasons cooking um, in New England, summer seasons cooking in New England, um, you know, it was time for college. And uh, so I decided to enroll at Hampshire College, which is out in Western Mass. Um, and uh, I gave that a try and I was there for a year and it didn't really wasn't a good fit. Right. Uh, for me or, or the school necessarily. Uh, so it was kind of mutually decided, let's say, between administration and my family and myself that it just liberal arts college wasn't the thing for me. Okay. Is there a good enough story here to go into or there's, should we just skip over? There's more in my <laughs> book. If you really want to dig deep, you can you can get into the book. But, What's um, the name of the book? I want to make sure we get it out. It's called Homegrown Cooking from My New England Roots. All right. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so, uh, moving on from there, uh, you know, there was a lot of conversation about taking a year off and I just, you know, my folks were like, we're well, going to work. You're not going to like just loaf around or whatever. Like, what, what are you going to do? And so I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how to do much besides cook. So I guess I'll do that. Um, so that's what I did. And I spent that year cooking in various places. Um, and I kind of fell even more in love with it. And at the end of that year, you know, my folks were kind of like, what's the story? What are we doing here? And I was like, well, I think this is really something I want to make a go of. So, uh, I started making a move towards going to culinary school and that was uh, new England culinary Institute here okay. in Vermont. Um, was there a key mentor at the new England culinary Institute that really like resonated with you that you just like connected with? That yeah. I mean, you? There, there are a bunch, honestly, like I was there at a pretty prolific time in the school's history. It was the early nineties. Um, it was probably the height of their, um, admissions, um, there was an amazing staff. Uh, I mean, I was doing stuff that I never had w- would have dreamt that I was doing. I was going to, you know, see animals butchered and slaughtered and broken down That's for the awesome. first time. You know, I was forging mushrooms with instructors. I, I had an instructor so much- on the show from there, and I'm trying to remember. I know his name was Cafe Provence, uh, mm. in, in, I think it's in Burlington. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Oh, it's killing me. It was one of my earliest episodes. Sorry to yeah. really keep going. But there was a there was a bunch of people there that were very influential at that time in my life, and and each of them represented kind of different opportunities within the curriculum, and the, most of which I'm still in touch. Most of whom I'm still in touch with today. Um, so it was a pretty awesome period for me, and I think also honestly. So much of it had to do with this place, right, and and Vermont and the incredible food ecosystem that is here. Um, I mean, I was just seeing so many things and being exposed to so many things and meeting farmers and seeing food come in the back door that was still had dirt on it. And like it was the first time that stuff like that really clicked with me and that I recognized that, you know, food comes from the earth and, you know, there's a great kind of in some places there's a great reverence for that relationship between kitchen and garden and wild food and, you know, the sea and like all of these things just really started to kind of influence the way I looked at food. Nice. So you graduate from culinary school. Uh, What's your plan? What's going through your mind? How are you, how are you visioning the rest of your life at this point? 
Well, I didn't know. I mean, I was still kind of, you know, young and dumb. And uh, I actually graduated culinary school and decided to go to California um, because I wanted to go be a snowboard bum at Lake Tahoe. Okay. Uh, and there happened to be an opportunity in a restaurant at the base of, of, uh, of Tahoe. So uh, that's what I did, right? And that was um, a really interesting experience in itself. But I didn't really know, like, I wanted to be a chef for, or, you know, in what capacity, I guess I would, I would kind of be involved in culinary. Um, but I kept spending time in the kitchen and I just kept loving it. But I think that's the best thing you can do when you're young, straight out of culinary school is just go travel. Yeah. You don't need to know what you want to do. All you need to do is get experiences and figure it out. Yeah. And I mean, I think the whole conversation about culinary school is even on the table. Like as much as I got out of it, it's not for everyone. Yeah. You know? And I wasn't going to say that because I, you know, but I, I'm right there with you. I don't necessarily encourage people. I mean, honestly, like I think it's, it can be great for you, but I, I, from my experience in the 700 plus interviews I've done, it's always the people that go into cul culinary school between the ages of like 22 and like 27 that get the mm. most out of it because mm. they they figure it out that they want this to be their path and they go into yeah. it with a whole different level of intentionality yeah and they just make the best out of those relationships and they always graduate at the top of their class yeah i think we also live in a world right now that's so different like you know that track of like making sure that you were backed up by uh you know, a degree, which was really important to my, f my folks at the time. And I, and I still believe in for and sure. And I think our parents aren't at, wrong for encouraging us because that's the world they came up in. Totally. But it, this is the information age. It's well, and I mean, world. I wouldn't lie to you. Like I, I, you know, I've got two boys and I think about it for them. Like how important is that stuff to me? Right. Um, but you know, that being said, we live in a world right now where like you can like, you know, the lines are so blurred yeah. and you can get out there and you can latch on to an experience that you get so much out of and maybe find mentors where you didn't think they existed. And like, you know, I, I, I think, I think that is pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you're, at, you're, you're in Tahoe, you're, you're a, a snowboard bum. You're working in a restaurant. Yep. How long were you here for? So I was just there for, uh, for a little over a year and then it was time to come back East. And so, um, I jumped in the, the, kind of beat up super with my buddy Jason Rose who um we'll get to in a minute um but uh Jason I hired as a line cook uh out in in Tahoe for one of for the restaurant that I was working in out there and we just totally hit it off he was a Massachusetts guy and you know another fellow mass hole and we just made kind of fast friends and anyways as the season came to an end, we got back in my 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 Subaru and drove back east. And uh, time stamp this for me because I know it was two thousand three. Yeah, when so so I don't know. This is probably two thousand one. Okay, gotcha. Yep. So uh, I have a hard time with the time stamp. No, so you'll have good. to you have to keep me on point there. Um, I'll do my best. I'm getting old, you know. So uh, so yeah, we got back and basically worked around you know uh, Boston. Um, Jason and I cooked in some restaurants together. We actually cooked at a restaurant called Truk, which was in the south end of Boston, together. Um, was that Salamander and Truk? Well, so no, Truk was first, and uh, Truk was owned by Amanda okay. Leiden, who's an awesome chef. Is an awesome chef. Um, and Jason and I were, uh, were, were working at Truk together. And then I took a gig at Salamander. Oh, okay. The way I heard it when yep. I was doing my research, it sounded like it was one location. Yep. Sorry. So Salamander was a different restaurant owned by Stan Frankenthaler, who is a chef in Boston and had just opened a big new restaurant downtown. And so I went over there um, and was exposed to kind of like the beauty of Asian cuisine and, uh, you know, his international fl flair and flavors. Um, and then I just kind of reached a point where... I didn't really know what the next step was, I guess. Um, okay. And I had kept hearing as a cook in Boston about this place called Formaggio Kitchen. And Formaggio is an institution. Um, it's a specialty gourmet food shop, if you will. Um, there's um, one in, in Huron Village in Cambridge, um, which is the kind of the mother store. And um, one of my sous chefs at Salamander, who is, who is uh, you know, who I reported to kind of decided to take us, uh, some of us cooks out for an afternoon experiencing new flavors and ingredients. And we went to Formaggio and it was the first time I'd been there. And I was like, how did I grow up in Boston, <laughs> cook here for a couple years, you know, be connected in this food community, not know that this place existed. Like, how is that even possible? Cause uh, walking in there was like, all of a sudden I'm in the best food museum I've mm. ever been in. You know, there's like amazing vinegars and oils and pastas and olives and cheeses. I, I and honestly, I'm, and, I'm from Southern New Hampshire, only an hour from yeah, Boston. I've yeah, never heard of it. Either, yeah. So. Oh man, it's a game changer. <laughs> so, so I fell in love with the store and, 
as it turned out, there was an opportunity there for a cheesemonger position. Okay. And slash cheese buyer. So before you get into that, yeah. I feel like there's got to be uh, something from your come up from Salamander and Truk. That is it. Must Truk. Truk. Yep. Truk. Truk. Um, these the the woman that Truk. What was her name? Amanda Lydon. Amanda. You said she was an incredible chef. Yep. Um, I'm assuming a great business owner too. Yep. What did you learn from her about business and, and operating restaurants? Well, I mean, I was so in the weeds at that point. I mean, you know, when you're a young twenty something yeah. year old cook, you don't really you don't have time to be thinking about business. You're thinking about how not to cut your hand off on a Friday night, you know, yeah. or or how to make sure that your station is mised out. <laughs> um, so you're not really thinking about business. You're just thinking about getting through the next day. Um, but she did make an impression on you because you or did she not oh no for sure i mean i i mean th- my impression was it was a culinary impression yeah. right i mean i learned how to make like steak frites correctly for the first time ever in my okay. life in that kitchen gotcha. you know <laughs> like those are things that you don't forget you okay. know what i mean um and she was also using some of these ingredients from formaggio mm-hmm. right like she had beautiful french cheeses on her menu um so i think that those things started to kind of influence the way that I looked at food even more. And I was like, okay, well it's about ingredients. So if it's about ingredients and it's about finding the best ingredients you can find what's out there. Right. Mm. And it continued, it continued my obsession with ingredients and like that had started in Vermont at culinary school. And then it continued into through some of my other jobs, but you know, really then it started to kind of cement itself in my head that like the food is only as good as the ingredients that you start with. Mm. And so that exposure, you know, led to formaggio and I walked in there and I was like looking at all these amazing things and seeing cheeses that were, you know, came from like a herd of 20 cows and somewhere random, you know, in in France. And, and you just begin to like connect the dots and be like, oh my God, food is like, it's a culture. Food's a culture. Um, and so I applied for position at Formaggio as cheese buyer and cheese monger. Um, and I got the job and I was actually very surprised because I had no experience um, but I connected immediately, immediately with the owner, Isan Gerdal, um, who is a just uh, amazing uh, force in, in the food world. And, uh, and so he kind of brought me in under his wing and taught me everything that there was to know about cheese primarily. Um, and, you know, also cured meats and all of the beautiful, you know, European and now uh, American delicacies that exist in that kind of world. And, so I fell in love and I fell down the rabbit hole of, of um, you know, even further with ingredients, right? Um, I also, uh, my first day, I showed up for work about 10 minutes early and the store was not open yet. I knocked on the front door and this beautiful six foot tall blonde in an apron and a wife beater in cut off jean shorts came to the door and let me in. And that's my wife. Um, Kate, I had the pleasure of meeting her. Yeah, I met Kate. I met Kate literally on my first day there. Um, And she was at that point in charge of um, catering and kind of helping run the bakery. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, so Kate and I kind of fell in love uh, over cured meats and and cheeses. I've got to ask, do you know the Wozniak? I think it's the Wozniak Brothers. Wasics. Wasics. Thank you very much. The cheese shop is what it was called. Yeah. Past guests on the show. I love those guys. They're awesome guys. Yeah. And that story is just gorgeous. Yeah. Literally wall to wall, ceiling to floor, amazing cheese. Yeah. Uh, They were great. Sorry, I can't help but think of them. No, for sure. So, um, so that's kind of how things really started, you know, and, um, yeah, I just I love that gig. And Isan sent me all over the world to go study with cheese makers and select cheeses for the horrible. store. And like it was literally a dream, right? It was a dream. It was like the most exceptional opportunity for a twenty year old kid. So why only two years? I just I don't know. I I I felt like inside I wanted to do my thing, mm. you know. And like even though I knew I didn't have enough experience, I just I kind of have this perspective that. Um, you know, I have a hard time. I, I have stuff that I know I want to be able to accomplish for myself, you know, and I don't like to kind of allow people or, you know, things to get in the way of that. It's and, the entrepreneur. In you you yeah, have your maybe, own vision. It may be, it may be that, it yeah. may be that, maybe just that entrepreneurial spirit. And I don't really know where that came from because no, no one in my family are entrepreneurs. Um, you know, my grandfather had a little bit in him, but it's not like a, it was a hand, you know, handed down. I, I just wanted to take the risk of doing something on my own. So um, so Kate and I started talking. She wanted to get some more pastry experience. Um, there was a couple different programs that were available to her. One was in High Park, New York at that quote-unquote 
other culinary school. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and then uh, one was uh, at the uh, sister school of, of that culinary institute out in Napa Valley. Gotcha. And so we had some conversations about like, what does that look like? You know, me staying at Formaggio and schlepping in a drive up to Hyde Park every weekend to see you or screw it. Let's just pack it up and move to California. So that's what we did. So we packed up the Subaru nice. again and and the Penske truck. And uh, we decided that we'd go to California. So back I went. Um, and so she enrolled at the Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park for the uh, advanced or accelerated pastry and baking program. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I made a couple of calls uh, before I left and ended up getting an opportunity um, with Cowgirl Creamery, okay. um, who are, are based in Point Reyes, California, and are a manufacturer, distributor, producer, uh, wholesaler, retailer of beautiful cheese. Okay. And, um, they source from local farms. They also make their own. They have their own creamery, the whole kind of thing. Um, but their focus is cheese. And so um, I'd had some good conversations with them, and they're like, yeah, well, when you're out here, why don't we kind of see how things go, and you know, we'll touch base when you get here. So um, with that relationship in mind, we set out and uh, I ended up uh, securing a a job with Cowgirl as a wholesale manager. So kind of managing some of their accounts um, in the Bay Area. Um, And it was great because I was like still kind of in the restaurant game. Like I was calling these amazing restaurants and selling them our cheeses. I was bringing them cheeses. We were doing trainings with chefs, you know, so I still kind of felt connected to the industry. But I wasn't in it. I wasn't in the grind. Okay. Um, but I just want to reflect up to this point because there's, there's a couple of key things that I think are worth bringing to the surface. One, the the, the importance of becoming a specialist, mm. right? Doing one thing really well and, and being the person that helps other people understand that one thing really well. Um, and you're selling to other people. You're networking at the same time. So you're developing all these relationships. And business sales at the end of the day is all about relationships and, and people, you totally. know? But when you can become a, a specialist, you know, there's, there's so much significance. Significance or so much value in that. Do you want to reflect on that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to this day, I'm still obsessed with like continuing to find ways to hone in on, you know, um, areas of focus. Mm. You know, even with what I do now, um, I'm I'm always a kind of get it done right, not get it done person. Mm-hmm. And so I think for me, that means that. I require of myself a little bit more focus in, in what I do and those relationships that you develop. Um, and so that was, that was a huge moment for me. I think you're right. I think in recognizing that, like, that's part of the process, you mm-hmm. know, is, is picking some things out that you really connect with and exploring them deeper and deeper yeah. and deeper. And then you, know? then you become a person of value because other people see the value that you bring to the table by being a specialist in something, right? Yeah. And you just open doors for yourself that way. So, um, Okay, back to your story. You're working for uh, the Cowgirls. So I'm working for the Cowgirls. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, and uh, Kate's going to culinary school, and we're living in St. Helena, California, northern end of the Napa Valley. Um, and it's awesome, and and it's you know it's lovely. It, we're I mean in California and in wine country, and so getting exposure to the world of wine in a new way that I never had. So that's having a new mm-hmm. wave of influence on me. Um, we actually made some friends that had vineyards at the time. So we're doing all the cool things like going through a crush and like making wine mm. and like tasting it at young, young ages from bar- you know, do bar- barrel tastings and like all this stuff that like I'd never been exposed to. Um, so it was just a whole nother like layer, yeah. you know, so it's kind of like continuing you're only to 22 build. at this time. Yeah. I mean, early twenties. Like people who are 22, 21 years old. I mean, you were a culinary student, so you, you're exposed to that, but just aren't doing these types of things they aren't going and developing their palate getting yeah. that different perspective and, and uh experience to like all the 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 bounty of this industry all the different things yeah you know? yeah well i mean i think you know i viewed it as like i have to work you know um i have to ideally i'm gonna whatever work it is that i'm doing i'm gonna love mm. i need to find a way to love like those two things were always were like neverly or we're, we're neverly. That's a that's a new word. I like it. Use that one again. Will you? <laughs> uh, those two things were never mutually exclusive. They had to be. For me, it had to be one thing. Mm-hmm. Like whatever I'm going to dive into, I got to love it. So you know? at this point, are you and Kate like saying like this is going to be our restaurant? This is what we're going to do. This is. The, are you visioning yet? Is it, are you guys it was all not that just serious like, yet? I think it was like I was cataloging it. You mm. know what I mean? Like I I um 
So I don't know if you've ever done the disc assessment. You ever done the disc assessment? No, assess- I have So check it out sometime. I have but to. anyways, it can't, <laughs> I just, I'm like hot on it right now because I just came out of a leadership conference last week where we did it. But long story short, it kind of breaks all of all of the personality types into four different types of birds. Oh, and I'm a, and I'm a parrot, okay. right? And and one of the parrot qualities is that like you're constantly developing this like catalog catalog of experiences in your life that you use to influence decision making. Mm. So as opposed to like an owl, right, who might like um, really get into the minutia of the planning and the data and the research, right? Parrots are more like exploratory and um, and more experiential. It's almost like that low road. You just collecting the data through experience and it's there you don't even necessarily know if you're using it but it's like that resource that exactly. you have and so i'm so happy you're saying that yeah because i feel like that's exactly what the 700 episodes of my life have been <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's what was happening i think is like all these things were kind of like just cataloging right in my psyche and like we're or somehow influencing what it was that we were going to do without really knowing it and then it just kind of became evident throughout that year and a half or whatever it was in california with kate that she was wrapping up her program. I had the opportunity to actually stay and open. Uh, so part of the conversation that was ongoing with the cowgirls was like, listen, I love what I'm doing, but I really miss retail. I miss like being in the shit. I miss like, you know, having those days where you're behind a counter, you're dealing with guests. Like I miss that kind of buzz that you get in the food retail world that you can also find in the kitchen, ironically. So I, and I wasn't getting that. And I said, I miss that. And they said, well, why don't you go open our new Ferry Plaza location? Um, and so that was on the table which would have been sick too, because that, I mean, Ferry Plaza is now like this amazing, you know, place for, um, incredible, you know, native California foods in San Francisco. Um, but, uh, we kicked it around a lot and we kind of both, both really missed New England. Yeah. So it was time to come home. Yeah. Um, and I think you realize what you miss until like, you, you don't, you don't realize what you have until you miss it. You're away from it. Right. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. And so we said, if we're going back, then, Let's do our own thing. All right. We're back in uh, where we left off. You and Kate were now saying, if we're going to do something, we're going to go back home. We're going to do our own thing. Yeah. So why Providence, uh, <laughs> Rhode Island? Why I can't Providence? Think, yeah, why Providence, Rhode Island? Because you didn't have any ties there. Because Providence is dope. I mean, It is a pretty awesome city. It's an incredible city. Um, why Providence? So, so that's a great question. So we knew we wanted to start small. We knew we wanted to do something that was like kind of very mom and poppy by intent right like we didn't want to do anything more than we could manage and you weren't planning to do a restaurant this time no 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 this was just a cheese shop yeah yeah so i should back up so this was like the vision and i started drawing i still have the drawings actually it's super cool i found them the other day but i drew out like the store right so it was a retail shop that had cheeses charcuterie you know some house-made items you know prepared foods kate was gonna do all the baked goods we'd have fresh coffee like the whole kind of that whole vibe Mm. um but restaurant i guess in the classic you know kind of form hadn't really entered my mind yet i knew that like there'd be some element of food service but i didn't i I figured to start it'd be like paninis Mm -hmm. you know whatever um so anyways uh so so we were kind of trying to figure out where to go and we didn't want to go to new york we felt like we'd kind of had done boston and 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 needed a little bit of a respite from from where we grew up um, and Providence just kind of kept coming on our radar. And, um, my mother at that time, and still to this day is living in the very Southern end of Rhode Island. Uh, and so she was going to be local too, um, which we were excited about. And Kate's family was not going to be that far away. Um, and so, uh, so we kind of figured we'd check it out. Um, yeah, so so Providence just kind of felt like a, a spot that we wanted to consider. I think what we loved about it was that it was a liberal arts town. Uh, you know, it had the universities, right? So we could plan on kind of that traffic um, and customer count, right? And events because of that also. Uh, it also was like on the seacoast, which, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of, of the ocean and of coastal cuisine so that was important to us um it was a quick drive to boston like there's just so many so many i feel like plus like in 2002 like providence is in the same city it was today i feel like it it kind of has 
freshened up a little bit in the past 20 years. Yeah, so when you were coming in. What were you trying to say? It wasn't nice back then? No. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But, like, I think a lot of those size cities or, like, a lot of people have been going, getting out of the bigger cities. And the, yeah. the people like you, the Matt Jennings of the world, have been going to these medium to smaller size cities to, like, kind of re-inject new life into them over the past 20 years. Yeah, it's definitely a periphery yeah, city. Yeah, but there's other cities like that, right? Lewis to Maine, I feel like, is mm. a city like that that's just, like, the bones are there because yeah. I want, it's the second largest city in Maine, right? Yeah. And it has great bones, but there's just so much opportunity in these not mainstream cities. Like, I know Providence, Rhode Island is, like, the capital of Rhode Island, but 20 years ago, I feel like it was kind of uh, on the come up. Well, I mean, you know, the the honest truth, too, is, like, there's so much about Providence and Rhode Island that we didn't even know about and, and, and um, that played to our benefit. Like, the food culture there is incredible, right? Mm. Like... Just, I mean, from the local seafood to, you know, Federal Hill to a lot of the young upstart entrepreneurs that come out of Johnson and Wales to, you know, so many different things. That's the other thing. We had the culinary school there, too. Yeah. So there's like so many great, great benefits of of living and doing business in Providence. I think the the, the what I was trying to the, the point I was trying to make is like I feel like people think they have to go to the biggest cities yep. to, to make things happen. I think there's more opportunity in smaller cities and it's easier to make a splash yeah. in a smaller city. So was that playing in the back of your head? It honestly wasn't like it was uh, making a splash was not like yeah. ever It was a cheese shop. Yeah, it was yeah. never the intent. Like yeah. I didn't need to go out uh you know, uh, and you know, do do anything uh, that drew a ton of attention to ourselves. I just wanted to have a great little business that Kate and I were going to operate ourselves and be in a place that we loved. You yeah. know, and so how'd you guys make it happen? Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, it was it was hard. Like we had no money, and so you know, I when we hit the ground, when we got back to New England. Um, Kate was baking at a local bakery in Providence and loving it. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to have to go cook or, you know, what was going to happen um, or wait tables or do something. And I was started poking around at different pieces of real estate, none of which I could afford. I really wanted to buy our own building. That wasn't possible at the time. Um, and so, you know, I was like the next best thing for me was looking at um, – businesses that were for sale okay and i found a couple but none of them really were the right fit and then i walked in one day to what was at that point the cheese shop of providence that was on the east side of providence so kind of up behind brown university was it that the name of the the cheese that was the name okay Okay, gotcha and and it had a great history it was actually part of a larger i guess you could call it chain uh but family owned multi-location cheese shops throughout new england there was one in in uh in wellesley which uh became wasics yeah. there was one um in uh oh god i'm totally gonna forget but there was there was providence there was Wellesley. it was a franchise oh, there was at a, one point there was right? a dairy in connecticut yeah there's one in connecticut so there's a few different locations okay and then they kind of splintered off and went to individual owners and whatever so this one um was owned by um a couple and they had been there for years and I walked in and I'll never forget like, you know, that like classic like moment where you walk in the door and like the little bell, you know, rings behind you and, you know, somebody comes out from behind the counter and we're talking and, you know, long story short, I kind of told them I, you know, I had some cheese experience and it was great to find them and blah, blah, blah. And I said, let's stay in touch. And so that conversation just kind of parlayed eventually after, you know, however long it took uh, a few weeks for me to say, hey, have you ever thought about selling? And she said, no, 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 you know, this is for my grandkids. I've been doing this forever. I want them to come and work here eventually one day. And I said, okay, well, if you ever consider it, just let me know and, you know, let it go at that. She literally called me the next day. And she was like, so were you serious? And I was like, yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> like, what does it look like for you? And so that started the process of talking about what it would mean to take over the cheese shop of Providence. So, of so, course, you know the Wazik brothers. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I had so I had a, a partner at that time. Yeah. Uh, who was a childhood friend who was really into wine. Okay. And so uh, the original intent was like, he'll do the wine, I'll do the cheese and food, Kate can do the baked goods, right? Kind of like patchwork it together. Um, and so we purchased the cheese shop of Providence, I think for like 25 grand, <laughs> something like That's that. Amazing. On like a loan from our family, so, like all three of us. So earlier you said that you wanted to buy something, so it, it, but that wasn't going to be a possibility for you. So the next best option was to take over something closing why is that the next best option 
Well, I mean, I think it had to be in a way like it had we it had to be within our within our ability to afford. Yeah. Number one, like we you know we were just super young and had no savings and no nothing, so it was kind of about trying to find an opportunity that fit with where we were financially. But I think also like I was excited about that particular opportunity because it had established roots. It was in the community. People knew it as a location for cheese specialty food you know great ingredients right um holiday stuff gift baskets so we like, had a baseline a foundation of customers right? yeah totally um and I'm, that's really what you're what you're po- buying when you buy a business, business right yeah it's like you're and this the, the cheese shops were franchised at one mm-hmm. point so yep. you're already um, I'm, I'm assuming there might have been some turnkey aspects elements to this business already totally and yeah. that's that was the biggest you know part was like we could walk in there it had a walk-in it had cases it had a counter it had right like all that stuff it had a deli slicer like i didn't have to buy anything yeah you know i could go to home depot and get a couple quarts of paint and start putting stuff on the walls and we could put in a new floor ourselves and that's branding. what we did yeah you know, that, that's literally what we did we like went to home depot and bought you know f- floor tiles and paint and you know caulk and started to go after it yeah. so it, it, like the thing is, like, there's so much opportunity out there if you just go looking for it, right? Mm-hmm. And being someone's exit strategy is a great way to break into the industry. So many times, like if, if there's a business that's been around for years and the owners are in their 60s or whatever, maybe maybe they're just done. I don't know what mm-hmm. this lady's story was, but mm-hmm. you know, maybe they just, they just had enough, or maybe they didn't fall in love with it love with it the, the way they thought they would right maybe the romance is gone you can be someone's ex- exit strategy and nine times out of ten people usually don't have one they don't they, their their plan of getting out of business is dying right <laughs> yeah. and if you can be that hope for somebody by all means go for it yeah and i think you know also when you kind of uh you have a vision right and you know that you can bring something that's new and different to the table and and you know I, god bless donna i love her the former owner um, but, you know, you walked in there and she was, you know, smoking a butt behind the counter. Yeah. Right. And like, that's not the kind of place I want to go buy food. Right. And so like that kind of. That might have been fine in like 1980. But yeah, things changed, yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. And so things change. That's exactly my point is like the whole place was ready and due for and asking for like new life to be breathed into it. And even the community, like I would say to a larger degree, like, you know, that that area of Providence also like really was asking for something. Are you saying Providence mean something was around Providence? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, that area, that neighborhood was could could support what I wanted to do. Gotcha. Right. Like I couldn't do that. I probably couldn't have been successful doing that if I'd opened like you know, in South Providence. Yeah. Right. And I think that's another lesson we were earlier. We were talking about, you don't have to go into the big cities, the New York cities, the, the Chicago's, the Boston's, the LA's, the San Francisco's to like make it like it's a great place to go to learn mm. from the best. But on that note of what, even within the city, if you can go on the edge, uh, cause it, er, things grow from the inside out. So you might not be able to get into it, but if you can get on the edge of it and you can hang on for five or 10 years, you're going to be in the middle of it eventually. Yep. That's the other variable too. It's the hanging on. That's the hard part. Yeah, for sure. So how did you guys hang on? What were the first few years like? Well, the first few years sucked. Um, I mean, you know, starting a small business from scratch with no prior experience, anybody will tell you is, uh, is like drinking from a fire hose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we learned a lot of hard lessons, um, long stories there, but you know, my original partnership didn't work out and that, that gentleman moved on. And then, then it was really like me and, and Kate was doing, you know, still baking at the, at the bakery, hadn't yet, uh, hadn't yet migrated over to Farmstead. So I was like, Oh man, like I can't do this by myself. I need your help. Now's the time. Now you got to come, you got to quit your job. You know, she's like, how are we going to do this? Like, we're not going to have a paycheck. I'm like, I don't know, but we're going to figure it out. So she moved over from her job and started helping me full time behind the counter and also baking. Right. And then it just kind of started to grow and we hired our first employee. So how many years are you in at this point? Or So this is still this is going into year two. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean. I love hovering over the the lessons learned the hard way just because Mm. I feel like if you made these mistakes, odds are there's other people about to make the same mistake, Mm. right? And the the whole purpose of the show is to to learn from the mistakes and the lessons of other people. So reflecting back on that first two years, what would you have done differently? Um, Some of the biggest lessons you learned the hard way. Yeah, well, I mean, knowing what I know about myself now, (laughs) I would say that I would have figured out a way to do it by myself like from the beginning i wouldn't have relied on a partnership necessarily knowing what you know about yourself what did you learn about yourself 
that I'm very particular. Okay. <laughs> I'm very particular. Um, and that I'm also my own worst critic, okay. right? I'm constantly uh, evaluating what I do and how I do it. And um, I'm tough on myself, mm-hmm. you know, which means I'm tough on the process, which means I'm tough on the business. And I overthink things a lot. And, uh, you know, because I like to get it right, okay. you know? Um, and so I think that point in my life, like I was too young for a business partnership. I didn't know what that meant. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't know what that obligation to somebody else meant. Um, because you do have an obligation to somebody yeah. else. Besides. Well, what, what do you know about that business partnership obligation now, now that you're seasoned, what do you know that you I mean, know them? I know that it's everything. I mean, I know, and, I, and I'll get to this eventually, but with full heart, you know, Jason, uh, and I have an incredible relationship. We've known each other for years and years, but you know, we went into it very uh in the very beginning having very transparent conversations about like hey listen it's you and me for this thing together and you know it's always an open book and we're always telling each other what we think and what our problems are that we need to fix and if i need you i'm shoulder tapping you and if you need me and you know um vice versa so yeah it is it is very much a partnership just as you were in a, a partnership marriage. with your your it's, wife I was just going to say yeah. it's a, it's a it's a legal binding document yeah it's a marriage tying you to somebody it's a marriage yeah. and i think to not take those things seriously is like is dev- can be devastating to the business, right? Absolutely. And that's where I was. I was mm-hmm. just, I didn't take it seriously. I was like, Wait, hey, you're 21, 22 years well, old? Yeah, exactly. Was, you don't know anything buddies. about yourself I was at this 20, point. I was probably 20, going on 24 at this point. Yeah, which is huge, by the way, yeah. being 23 yeah. years old and starting your own business yeah. in the city. Like, I think that's a big move. Yeah, it was It was scary. It was yeah. scary. Um, so, so Kate came in. We started working together. We kind of started increasing the sales. I was changing the product set, right? Bringing some new interesting cheeses kind of tiptoeing into it though because this woman had like a long history of customers in the neighborhood like who were also kind of timing out right like you know the days of kind of like mini you know wiener schnitzel in in water in a can was like you know going away right so like I was kind of upgrading the inventory and with that we started developing a new clientele so it was like very organic type of thing and it was changing you know um and Kate started making baked goods. And then people were like, oh, my God, there's these amazing baked goods here, too. And like, wow, did you see what these two kids are doing over here? This is really interesting. Like, good for them. Right. And like the word kind of started to get. Yes. It was very organic. Yes. I love that. Um, and so then we hired our first employee and then we hired our second employee. And then we decided we'd start doing farmers markets, which okay. um, we had gotten approved to go and sell cheeses at the local farmers markets that were not our own. We were actually the first vendor at Rhode Island farmers markets that w- weren't selling our own product. Ooh, how did that go over? Well, it was hard because we had to convince people that there was a desire, there was a consumer desire there, right? Yeah. Um, and I said, well, listen, if I'm not, at this point, Rhode Island didn't have any cheesemakers. And I was like, if I'm not a cheesemaker and I'm in Rhode Island, you know, and I want to represent great cheesemakers, why not have somebody then that was really proficient in what they're doing and knows a lot has the knowledge base that can represent them at the farmers markets and so yeah okay they, they got wrap their head around that and that just totally like took off so there we were it, was, it basically provided us a whole nother outlet for retail that's marketing right there totally, too like yeah. you, like you might not have a lot of foot traffic or maybe you did maybe you, but when you're at a farmer's market I mean, anybody who goes to a farmer's market, they're stopping and looking at every stall. Totally. And like, what's this? And totally. like, oh, you have a store? Like, it's, it's a great idea. And it was great brand recognition for the store because they're like, oh, my God, that's right. Oh, you're that place in Wayland Square. Oh, you're that place. Oh, you're, we heard a lot of that. And now you're mm-hmm. not just a place. You're a person. Yep. You know, you're Matt and Kate. Yep. And, and now there's a relationship starting. It, yep. it's, it's so powerful. And so that just kept parling into opportunity for us. And... Um, you know, we actually went because of the farmers market. We ended up meeting somebody who owned a vineyard in Southern Rhode Island, and we went down and, you know, we made an agreement with them that we would start creating a small lunch menu yeah. on their vineyard. Do me a favor, tilt that mic up just a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cool. How's that? Better? Good, good. Yeah. Um, and so we made this relationship that we would start uh, providing some very simple lunches at their vineyard um, in the summertime when they obviously had uh, tourism going on. And so we went down there. And did that, and then it was like, oh, wait, this is cool. This feels good to be back in a kitchen. I'm making sandwiches. I'm making salads. I'm, like, you know, doing stuff that I know. I love this buzz. It's different than the retail world. Hey, maybe we can bring some element of this to our store. Yes. So, wait, so what? reflecting back up to what you've shared with us, what do you think you were doing right? What was right about the approach you took? What was right about the approach I took? I think, the, I think what was right about the approach was that we never – tried to be more than we were 
we kind of tried to always focus on the quality of what we were doing, the experience that we were offering guests, um, and letting that drive everything. Yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier that you're very meticulous. There's a certain way. You were putting your energy into the thing. And I think yeah. all the times when people, they get a business, they get the, the, the business, the thing to a certain point, and they never take it further. And they say, that's good enough. And then they focus on putting the energy out grow yeah. out like in, but i feel like when when you put that energy in the opportunities come to you yeah and it's a double-edged sword i mean like i'll tell you you know in a moment like you know there's all there can also be a death of you by too much detail mm-hmm. right like yeah. I, I mean your strengths are also your biggest weaknesses right 100 percent. yeah right and like because i like things right means like i like surrounding myself with you know team that will understand that and execute right right so it's like then you're talking about, you know, more expensive ingredients. You're talking about higher labor costs. You're talking about, right, like all those things. Like, so you have to, it's a balancing act, right? It's definitely a balancing act. For sure. So anyway, so we brought the stuff we were doing at the vineyard um, up to our, our, our mothership there in Providence and started doing kind of paninis and salads and like very casual to go lunch. And then we put a couple of tables outside and I'm like, oh my God, we're kind of doing cafe service. This is cool. And then the woman who owned the store next to us, um, it was uh, it was kind of this Australian skin cream shop. Um, she, um, I think, was having a hard time and was trying to figure out a segue for herself out of that business. Uh, and so I said, hey, why don't we take that space over? It's right next door. We can knock a hole in the wall. We can put in some tables um, and we can try maybe another like kind of evolution of elevated service for farmstead yes so that's kind of where that started to i mean sometimes i feel like a lot of this happens to be with luck um like you when you bought that or you went and took over that space two three years prior you didn't know that the store next door was going to leave um and i mean it but it's a slow organic natural growth focusing on doing the thing and 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 focusing on just being involved with the community making relationships like if you do something right and you do it well, people yeah. are going to notice, and you're going to create opportunity for yourself. But it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. It happens slowly over years of putting the work in. And yeah. I can't help but think of my boy Kyle right now. You know who you are, Kyle. You're listening to this, and he wants to open a sandwich shop. And he's, I'm literally, I'm telling him just to go, like, meet people, talk to people, tell them, start sharing what you do, your passion, and like, if you are good at it and you have that passion, like, the opportunities will come. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, so that was great, and that just kind of happened to, like you say, just continue to grow organically. Um, and so when that opportunity arose, we kind of stopped and we said, "All right, well, if this is going to happen, and we're going to put in seating, and we're going to like have to build some kind of a kitchen, we got to figure this out because you know this is going to be expensive. Yep. We need to make sure we're going to get the ROI on this. And like, we don't have staff. Like, how's this whole thing? Like, I had no idea how we were going to. So I'm like, we're opening a restaurant, basically. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Like, now we're opening the restaurant. Yeah. Okay, shit. Um, and so that's, that's you know, what happened. Um, we did, uh, we with the help of, uh, you know, Bank of Rhode Island and some <laughs> some, uh, some other friends, we, uh, we got ourselves uh, together and in order and uh, embarked on the next journey of Farmstead, which was... Um, which was opening uh, a 34 seat bistro mm. next door. So, what about people who are listening to this right now who might be in that situation where they're they they started small and there's opportunity literally right next door that's about to open up and they're thinking about blowing out that wall? What are some of the lessons you learned the hard way going through that experience? Well, there was plenty. Um, I think I think probably the most singular important thing in this whole process, whether it's a 34 seat or 20 seat bistro, or it's a 150 seat, uh, you know, high end restaurant in the bottom of, or in the middle of downtown Boston. Uh, it is to stick to your vision, right. And not let people yes. sway you. Yes. Um, not being influenced by, or, or not, not making decisions based on outside influence is super critical. Mm-hmm. Super critical. How do you stick to that vision? What things did you do to make sure that you didn't get off it's that so course? hard, dude. It's so hard. I think that's like the hardest part is, is turning it off, right? Like just knowing that what you're doing is right and you have to just stay on the path and like stay true to what you want to do. Um, it's probably the hardest thing. I know? mean, I think the first thing you can do is write it down and share it and remind other people, you know, I think just, get, just by the practice of like saying it out loud over yeah. and over and over again, 
it's it's manifest destiny. You yeah. know, it, it's it's and, and I silly, think but not being afraid to say no. Mm. Like no is a really good word. Yeah, <laughs> that's I think it's why it's so important to write down your vision where you are going because then you're not saying no. Your vision's saying no. You you committed to that picture of yeah. what the future looks like, right? Yeah. And when something comes to you that's not taking you in that direction, then you it's the making these decisions are easier. Yeah, and it and it, and that never leaves your life. I mean, I can tell you now. What are we talking about? Twenty years later, or whatever yeah. it is, like that that concept of knowing when to say no has never been more important but this is like so i I always say this on the show the more i learn the more i realize i don't know anything because (laughs) like yesterday i had somebody on the show that says always say yes Mm -hmm. and i think that there's the answer is both right but i think it depends on where you are in your journey when you're on the come up say yes to everything you know but when you are on a path and you know where you're going you only have so many yeses to give out yeah one thing you say yes to is something else you have to say no to totally you know um yeah so that was uh that was farmstead in la leiterie and what an incredible ride that was so that you know fast forward that we were there for 10 years um it was awesome. We had an incredible community of, of friends and, and employees and customers and just like it was a special, special place. I think to this day, if you go back and you kind of talk to people who, you know, frequented our establishments, um, they'll tell you that they miss it. So you were there for 10 years. It took yeah. it sounds like two to three years to get to the point where you're doing food and beverage uh, yep. as a restaurant. Yep. Um, you got, I think, two James Beard nominations, Best Chef Northeast in that time. Yep. Um, like three, three actually, during that time. Okay. okay, five, f- five all together. No, I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> five all together. I know you got one more in the, for the book too. Yeah, yep, yeah. Um, so what was going on in your lives? I mean, it sounds like you has like you're you're making an imprint in Ver- uh, Rhode Island, Vermont. Or what, what am I saying? Rhode Island, probably is Rhode Island. You're making an imprint. You're growing relationships in the city. You you have roots established. Ten years of effort. Right? Why leave that city to go to Boston? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I think the perspective may have been that, like, we wanted to level up and we wanted, like, you know, to seek more opportunity and notoriety and, like, right, like, kind of take it to center stage. And that's actually not what it was about for me. Um, It was about moving home. It was Mm. about getting back to Boston. It was about, like, being in that community. I really missed it. I was spending so much time you know, even when we lived in Providence up there, like taking my, you know, my, my babies at that point, you know, or little kids to my toddlers to Fenway or going up and seeing family outside the city or spending time with Kate's family outside the city. Like we were always up there and we felt like, why don't we just go? Um, you know, and we have a platform now that we can hopefully try and find a way to kind of at least leverage into a new evolution of business and, you know, I had, I had was, was and am very close friends with a lot of the Boston Chef community at that point. And so we, you know, it just it felt like it was a good, again, an, an evolution. Yeah. Right. So Townsman, was that like the was that because you were of this town, Townsman? Like what was with the name of that? Restaurant? Yeah. So the name of the restaurant is in reference to um, I in fact, I originally wanted to call it Towny because I just thought it was such a fun kind of like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like word. Um, but it felt like more of a bar to me than a, than a full sit down restaurant. So yeah. we went with the full, the full word. proper. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Townsman, uh, just referenced somebody who's native to a place. Right. So, um, being that I was from there originally, it just kind of felt like a fun throwbacky kind of, kind of name, you know? So what was that transition like taking, um, you know, having to strip down a brand that you spent 10 years building mm. to the, to, to kind of develop a whole new brand? Um, why not keep both restaurants? So was that on your radar at one point? Yeah, but again, like I I didn't know that I was even going to, you know, like I didn't know what the future held and I like being in the thick of it. I like having my hands and stuff. I like overseeing. I like kind of being engaged and involved and I just felt like I'd be constantly running back and forth and, you know, um you know, so so we decided to make the move. Um before plus we, before we get into that, there's one thing I'm really curious about. And I want to pull back layers here. Um when you, I mean, you built up um, Farmstead, mm. well-known establishment. Um, were you thinking of your? Like, were you trying to think about how you could build this into something that? I mean, eventually you knew you were going to be moving to Boston. You made that decision. Mm. When you made that decision, did you did you sell Farmstead? Did you did mm. the, yeah. the whole company, or did somebody just buy the space and move in and put something different? Like, what was that process of 
your exit strategy. Yeah, basically. yeah. So we 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 basically ended up doing the same thing that the former did with us. Was we found a young entrepreneur who was coming in who wanted to open their own restaurant and couldn't have afforded to otherwise and you know sold it sold it to him so you sold it um with all the equipment and uh yeah. was it the business or just the, the framing so he didn't get the name okay um he didn't get the the brand or the identity but he got pretty much all everything in the four walls i mean we talk a lot about opening restaurants with exception to my people my people decided to go elsewhere okay so. <laughs> so we talk a lot about opening restaurants and what what you have to do to, to start your restaurant but we never talk about selling your restaurant to go for mm-hmm. another opportunity we got dogs, know, it's crows, crazy, got, it's, it's crickets. I'm telling you what. Well, depending on what time it, we hit here, like there is a calculated time of morning and evening when the geese fly directly over the house. Like it's 640 right now. Uh, you get it? We may hit it. Nice. We may hit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm cool with it. You cool with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So what what advice do you have for selling your restaurant um, intentionally to, to create opportunity for yourself elsewhere? Well, I mean, the, I think the first, <laughs> the first key is like, don't don't expect to get what you think it's worth. <laughs> OK. Um, you know, I think you have to be flexible. Uh, for us, it was about it, it was obviously important to get to cover the investment that we'd made. And yet, at the same time, it was equally as important for me to find somebody that was going to shepherd that business into a new era, that was going to be a part of the community, that was going to, you know, develop a team the way that I love developing a team, you know, that would be there for their customers. Like, that stuff just really is important to me, too. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the, he's still there to that day. Nice. Yeah, to this day. So, you know, so um, that was the right decision for us at that time. Okay. Beautiful. Um, but... Uh, you know, we couldn't have made the move without selling, I don't think. Okay. You know, it was just time. I think it's just your style, your approach. Um, you, you seem like, the, from what I can gather, the kind of person that wants to have their hand on things. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. I mean, some people would say, like, you should never be in your business. You need mm-hmm. to create a business that doesn't need you. But if that's where you want to be, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's what you want, then there's nothing wrong with it. And I don't know if you're if you're the personality that would want to, to have something else somewhere that they can't see or touch yeah i don't i don't know that i would i mean i've been involved in some you know some startups and some things like that since since those days and you know those have been fine but it's it's a weird kind of like tangential relationship you know it's different it's just different so so when you're opening uh townsman uh in 2013 i believe uh what were you going to do differently what were the lessons you learned the hard way and you're like okay now we're with opening this restaurant with a with having one of these under our belt and Mm. being a little bit more groomed and experienced what was different about that opening well it was uh it was completely different it was uh it was um it was a big undertaking um it was a big financial undertaking it was a big uh operational undertaking um there was a lot of lessons learned, I would say, post Townsman, looking back, um, that I would have done differently. Um, like what? Well, you know, I would say that. I, let, let me put it to you this way: I we we created the team at Townsman created something incredibly special. I still believe that, um, and in fact. A lot of my team I'm still very close with, and they articulate the fact that they really miss that restaurant. Um, but it, it, you know, I don't know that I would have done it again, mm. and I mean that in the nicest, you know, way. I just it, it, the timing wasn't right in my life. Um, I was unhealthy. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I had some, you know, some, some issues with sobriety. I had some issues with, uh, being very overweight and out of shape and, and just generally not taking care of myself. Um, I had some issues with mental health. Um, and so all of those things like just kind of snowballed in that, in that process. So, I think I said 2013 earlier. Not that the I I don't know how my my mind just works chronologically. It was actually 2015. You had Townsman from 2015 to 2018, um, and at one point, and I I know you up. I think I read someplace you were up to 400 pounds yeah. at one point. Yep. Um, and I'm assuming this is 2015 to 2016. Mm-hmm. 
um, you got you had some surgery, yep. uh, the help, and you started exercising. You started getting better. Was it was yeah. it just like all this stuff coming to a head where you're like, I need to make a change in my life? Like what what made you like just hit hit the switch and just turn your life yeah. into a different direction? Well, I had a couple of uh, coming to God moments. Um, one was I was uh, it was after Townsman had had been open for a couple of years, and I was headed down to. New York City on the train to go do CBS this morning, and uh, I had gotten out of work at about two or three in the morning the night before because I'd obviously closed and you know closed the restaurant down, um, and um, and got home like threw a bunch of stuff in a bag and like hit the sack, slept for a couple hours, woke up to like hit a six a.m. Amtrak out of South Station to go to to go to New York to go to Manhattan, um, and I remember getting to Manhattan getting into my hotel room, opening my suitcase and realizing that I'd only packed socks and underwear, but no clothes. Cause I was just so exhausted and so out of it and so tired. And I had to be on national TV in like an hour and a half or two Ooh. hours, whatever it was. Yeah. And I'm like, Holy shit, I gotta go shopping. And then I remember running around the streets of Manhattan, literally having a panic attack and crying because I couldn't just walk into any store and buy clothes. Uh, Cause I was so big. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? Like that feeling of helplessness, you know? Um, and so uh, I eventually found like a big and tall store somewhere way outside the city. I had to take a cab way out, you know, and literally like made it happen, right? Like in the, in the nick of time. Um, and actually, if you go back now and watch that episode of CBS this morning, I look great. Totally good. Totally decked out. <laughs> yeah, totally decked out. I got like a nice jacket. I got to like, find that clip. A little and pocket put it in square. The show I was like, I was <laughs> pimping. But, um, but it was a real eye-opening moment for me that, like, this is not okay. This mm. is not sustainable, right? This is not good for my team, for my restaurant, for my family, like, none of it. Um, and then I had another moment. Um, sh- well, so 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 that happened, and then I remember taking the train back, thinking about it the whole way back. I walked into the kitchen when I got home in Arlington, where we were living, and uh, I said to my wife, Kate, I'm like, I'm done. Like, I'm not, I can't live like this anymore. Mm. I got to make a change. And she's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know, but I got to today, like today, it starts today. Uh, and then that ended up kind of turning into like some doctor's appointments. And I remember having one of my doctors be like, um, you've got a choice. You know, you, you're at kind of the point where you can make a decision. You can choose to live or die. And you like, just put it very black and white. And I was like, yo, that's intense. <laughs> that is crazy. And so that, like, those, the culmination of those two moments just kind of, like, I decided to turn the page, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, you also mentioned uh, mental health. Uh, yeah. Was it just because of your, you think it was all the stress of the restaurant? Was it be, was it the, the self-consciousness of your physical situation? What was going on? With this, the- I think it was all of it. Like, I was always kind of, like, known to be this, like, you know, like, douchey, over-the-top, like, big fat like party animal you know it was kind of like part of my personality i haven't picked up on the douchiness now, well but. you know what i mean just kind of like kind of like always the guy in the room like yeah. the clown yeah, right yeah, yeah, like that, that just kind of got built into the personality and like um i think you know i i, I part of it was like is that who i want to be is that who i am you know um what do i want to be uh you know how am i going to get there Right. Like all those things. But plus, like I had this whole layer of anxiety issues because of the restaurant. I had Mm. there was a lot of stuff going on in the restaurant. There was just some just some weird stuff happening with staff and and the team and, you know, the investors. And and just like it was messy. It was just Mm -hmm. messy. Constantly. I was constantly cleaning up messes. Um, I know it gets weird with talking about people because you don't want you want to respect other people's side of the story. You don't want to say things publicly. But is there anything you can give us along the lines of what was going on so we can maybe we're in the same situation and I want to know where you were and how you got out of it. So other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the bottom line is like I was struggling like I was we were we were grinding and we were having a hard time making it. Yeah, you know, it was it was I need to give some more context for the listeners. So Townsman 2015 to 2018 you're named today's top 10 restaurants Esquire's top 10 re- restaurants Food and Wine top 10 restaurants yeah. you won another James Beard semi or you were nominated uh semi-finalist for James Beard best chef northeast yep. what else was going on during this time 
Anything I'm missing? But uh, have mean, I painted the picture yet? You mean quote unquote Out, accolades? Outside wise? looking in, I was you're writing a cookbook. It. You're at the yeah, writing the cookbook. You get yeah. a James Beard for the cookbook, um, or not do, at least I a nomination. On, I was yeah, I was on friggin' Food Network. I was on all sorts of shows, but none of that shit means anything. Exactly. But at the, in the same time, from the outside looking in, like what's wrong with our friggin' industry? Where we're this is the shit we have to put ourselves through yeah. to get these accolades, yeah. and what's it worth? You know, I think there's a lot wrong with our industry. We put so much emphasis on getting these accolades. And I'm not saying you didn't earn those. I don't want to pull, like, I don't want to, like. Dude, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. Like, listen, I I am the first one to tell you that it is a black hole, right? Like, that process of seeking validation in this industry is a black hole. I, I literally was just talking to Michael from Maypop and Mofo in New Orleans. Same situation, like getting all these accolades, and they're just scraping to get by. And you think that, like, if we if we reach this point in our career, in our like, we should be secure. Yeah, dude. I mean, at least secure, not rich, not rolling in it, but secure. I remember having like crazy meetings with with my 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 leadership team, um, in Townsman when it was like, you know, the week my beard nom came out the cookbook we just wrapped on shooting like whatever it was right like literally all these amazing things happening in one week and then my accountant being like you're not solvent how are we going to get you solvent (laughs) you know and it's like fuck but i think the issue is we glorify (laughs) your situation we glorify these accolades we say if we get these things yeah it's going to be all right well and admittedly like i like I and and this comes again, like you know, hindsight's always what is it? What is it? Twenty twenty, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> they almost said fifty fifty. <laughs> um, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Good. Um, that's that's real good vision. <laughs> um, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I needed help. You know, mm-hmm. I needed help. Not just not just on the business side of things, but like on the me side of things, like mm-hmm. the personal side of things. Like, I was broke. I was a broken human. You know, and like because of that, everything else was fucked. Yeah. You know, so it was like you can't. You can't accomplish your goals for yourself or anyone else until you're until you're right. You know, until you take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Yeah, absolutely, man. And um, and that was just kind of where I was at. And I didn't, I wasn't able to recognize any of that at the time. And I was very defensive. And I just, you know, I needed help, but I didn't want to ask for it. Or I was like, no, I got this. Don't worry, we're gonna be fine. We're just gonna like grind it out like I always do. Put my head down and go and come yeah. out the other side. And, and there is truth to that that if you do grind it out, if you do put the work in, if you like there is another end. But stubborn. Yeah, and like it, I don't want to say like no matter how hard it work, it's pointless because there is some truth to like putting the work in, but you have to have like a strategy to get yourself out of the situation. Yeah, I was stubborn. And and that and that is another great tip I will say for people in this industry is like Surround yourself with amazing people. Absolutely. And listen to them. Yes. Listen to them. I'm not saying, you know, earlier we talked about not swaying from your vision. That's different, right? Like for sure, stick to your vision and commit to it and don't be influenced by the outside voices. But when you do find those voices that have meaning in your life, dude, you got to lock into those people. Yeah. I'm so happy you're saying this because this is literally like the the coming to the, the realization I had recently traveling all over the country being like, I'm meeting all these people. I have all this. I have these great people in my network. But like a lot of shallow relationships, a lot yeah. of one hour and 30 minute relationships, you know, yeah. like and exactly to what you're saying. Now I'm, I'm going back saying, who are the people who really made an impression on me? Who are the people I want to go deeper? Who are the people I want to bring back on the show to say these people really had some great advice? Let's learn more from them. Yeah. And like I'm, I'm making that that network for myself. I'm going back to those people. And like you need those people. You need those core, the, 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 the you know, the backbone, you yeah, know, for, for sure. sure. So, so that was, that was a big, um, learning curve for me. And, and so I guess out of, uh, after a lot of counseling and, um, you know, relationship management and, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, I, I realized that the best thing for me to do was to, was to take some, like, I had to take a break. I had to take. What were the, the, the relationships you're most needing managed? Or my on. my marriage okay my marriage was was fucked yeah um, at it's... that point and and there was no way that i was gonna let that yeah slide so i know it was i think it was 2018 is when you closed townsman um you guys um i'm not sure what was the reason for closing well it was all the things that i just mentioned yeah. um it was you know it was unsustainable financially it was unsustainable uh from a personal perspective like you know um I had to get well. I had to get right. Um, 
and so and so um in order to do that i had to like you know pull myself out of it for a little while and and i knew that like if i did that the place wasn't going to be the same you know and uh so again it was that like control issue yeah. piece right um and so um it just it was it, it it had to happen it was just the time that uh that i that i needed to get back for myself to get well you mm-hmm. know um so i know was, you got sick too i know i remember because i was following you i'm still following you on, on, on instagram and i remember seeing you in the hospital i think it was right around 2018 yeah well that was that was like like the low point was like i literally uh i worked myself into a place of like i had a full collapse basically um and people and the doctors still don't know what it was um but it was definitely anxiety stress you know health induced and like, you know, it was a middle of the night, like mist hitting my head on the bathtub by like a centimeter, you know, wife staring into my eyes, asking me what's wrong, me not being able to answer, you know, type of situation. And I'm like, I'm not going back there, you know, and I was in the hospital for a week and yeah, it was, it was, it was not good. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think the, all of those things where we were kind of like, is this what we want to do? Is this right? Is chasing like what's it for is chasing that yeah. ring like this important you know and my answer was no yeah. and that 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 hurt i mean it hurt like what ring specifically were you chasing well i mean i think like when we look at the industry right it's like and you're in it like when you're in it and you're in the pocket and you're trying to kind of f- carve out a name for yourself or carve out success for whatever you know whatever success means to you like you know you you are not taking the time to bring your head up and look around and like look at the ramifications you're having with in your relationships and you know with your family and uh, with your friends and um in your community and so i uh i had to do that you know um and and so none of the rest of it was really worth it to me at that point you know mm-hmm. um particularly like kind of with the realization like no matter how hard we're trying to work to get this thing to go you know the realization was that really what I should be doing in this location is like a sandwich shop or like a fried chicken place mm-hmm. or like, a, you know what I mean? Like, so you say, you no know, matter how hard we work to get this thing to go, what, what were you missing? I mean, from my eyes, like, I feel like you got amazing accolades. Like you, you, it's not like you're not having this thing work. What were, like, where, how far away were you from where you wanted to be? Well, I think it was a lot. It was a lot of influencing factors. Like we had it. We had an over twenty thousand dollar a month debt service. Mm. Like, how do you do that? You know, how do you do that in 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 this industry? Um, you know, the, the the model from the beginning was broken, right? Like whether it was the deal with the landlord or it was the investors, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the amount or um, the certain personalities yeah. of investors, right? I or think- what, like the whole thing was broken the, and then, and then it was broken from the inside too. You know what I mean? Mm. Like with me, like I was not good. So like the whole thing, it just was like, but I think you make a really crazy. good point. And I agree with you 100%. The whole system's broken. Yeah. And like, I think that's where the conversation needs to start. It's like, what's wrong with our system, which is why we need to have people like yourself sharing information, sharing like the truth and sharing what's wrong. So we can collectively make it right because here's the thing we do it to ourselves yeah we put we put ourselves in this situation we are the reason why the industry is like this because we just i don't know why honestly but like what what are your thoughts well, on why i mean we, well we Town, townsman is like the the perfect example of like you know a developer who wanted a chefy driven place in their building right as an a, as a as a amenity for their building um who like we didn't work out the best deal with on our behalf, yeah. you know, uh, like, you know, so going into it, it was kind of like already stacked. What would you change about your deal without getting into like make it personal? Like anything you would have done differently? About no, I mean, like I wouldn't have taken on a 5,500 square foot space, you know, like I had an opportunity to go do something like in Cambridge or Somerville that was like 2,500 square feet, mm-hmm. or 2,000 square feet where I could go in and I could touch every station every day and I could like whatever. But again, I got wrapped. I got wrapped in like... 150 seats downtown you know big brasserie like big fancy shiny thing like i got wrapped in it Mm -hmm. admittedly for sure like it was exciting you know and like and i had a lot of people had a big team behind me that was supporting it and so like once that train left the station it's pretty fucking hard to bring it back you know what i mean the money's in you've got you're engaged with architects and designers and 
you know, general contractors and equipment's coming in and it's like, holy shit, there's no stopping now. We're yeah. going, you know, so so that that part of it, like I would have, you know, I still think about like there's a couple little tiny hole in the wall spaces that I looked at that was like, I don't know, it's a little too small. Can I make the kind of money I need to make here? I don't know. Like I would have in retrospect probably been better off like doing something like I did with Farmstead. Yeah. Which was like small, containable, controllable. Scale you know, slowly over time. Scale slowly over time. Scale organically. Do it right instead of like try and like do this big, massive, you know, project. Yeah. Awesome. Man, I'm loving the conversation. I'm looking down at the time. We still got to talk about what you got going on now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've been you've been away from towns and townsmen for two years now. Uh, you moved to Vermont. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you're really making d- decisions in your life uh, that are going to be great for you and for your marriage and for your well-being and for your mental health and your physical health. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you're kind of you're, you're starting with what what you need. Mm. What, what Matthew Jennings, what needs. the family needs in the fam, but you yeah. need your family, right? Like yeah. everybody needs to be happy. Um, and that was where you started. And now you're kind of reverse engineering from there. Yeah. Um, so if we're listening to this and we're like, that sounds like the right thing. How do I do that? Mm. I mean, it looks like you're doing really well for yourself. Like, you know, like things. Well, it's good. just a matter of like priorities, right? Like mm-hmm. prioritizing your decisions. Like, so, so Townsman led me to reckon I'd been doing a little bit of consulting and that was going well. And then, you know, one of my best customers at Townsman was at that point, the, um, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're one, good. one of my best customers at Townsman at that point was, uh, the director of, of marketing or the, um, why is it, what's the word I'm looking for? The, Mark C O O C C M O C M O. Yes. Jesus. Director. God, I totally chief just marketing like, officer. See what? I'm just, I'm stare, <laughs> yeah. I was it's seven off, o'clock. I was staring off into the green. Um, yeah, that's the CMO at Dunkin' Donuts, excuse me. And so he was saying, like, hey, listen, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of changing the course over there. We want to start focusing on better food and this and that. You know, would you, have you, would you think about coming and doing some consulting for us? And I said, yeah. So we started kicking it around, and that was Full Heart's first consulting project, nice. right? That's not a bad Which was awesome. gig we, to have. Yeah, it was awesome. We got hit. to contribute to, like, the future brand identity of Dunkin' and create some awesome new menu items, you know, some of which you've seen roll out in the last, you know, couple of years here. Um, and that was a great, like, way for me to put my flag in the ground and say, like, cool, I can still be in food, but this is more sustainable. I can work from home. Um, there's a future here, right? And and so so once I kind of got off the ground with Dunkin', my, um, my partner, Jason Rose, who I mentioned earlier, you know, we've known each other forever, started as chefs in Tahoe or cooks in Tahoe together. Um, he was also at a place where he was kind of like, I want to do something new. Can I, why don't I come help you with full heart? And I was like, absolutely. So he joined on. So was he, he your partner at Townsman too? No, no, okay. no, no. He was in California at that gotcha, time. Gotcha. So he was working for a company in San Francisco Bay area called Byright, which is the Byright oh, family of businesses. I, dude, they're on my radar. Oh, love they're amazing, dude. They're amazing. So he was their culinary director. So he was running all the all the food ops in all of their locations, and um, he was just kind of ready for a change. And so uh, I said, "Well, how about this? You come on board. You do kind of West Coast. I'll do East Coast, and then we can kind of collaborate on everything else in between." So he said, "Great." So um, we were off to the races with full heart, and then that just kind of started parlaying one opportunity into the next, and yada yada. So that went that went great, and um, that was really exciting work because I was still in food, I was still in culinary, but I wasn't like behind the line every night. You know, I was home with my family, um, and that allowed me to not only kind of have a great lifestyle with my family, but make the transition to where we really wanted to be, right? Which Where's is, that? Which is here. Yeah, uh, here I don't in, blame you, man. This is a beautiful yeah, place to exist. Which is here in Vermont. So. So my wife is originally from Southern Vermont, and we'd always talked about coming back. We talked about, you know, my experiences at Necky and how much I loved it here. And, you know, and I, I, it's always had a very warm place in my heart. Um, I've always felt very connected here. Like, you know, when you have your place, you kind of know where your place is. And, like, it just, like, strikes a chord with you. And Vermont's always done that for me. Yeah. And so we've always talked about trying to figure out how to come back, and we're never able to make it happen because of the restaurant life. Um, and so with Full Heart, I said, well – why don't we figure out a way to make this a possibility? So um, we were able to segue into um, looking around at different spots, and we have some family and friends that live in this town here. And um, and so we started spending a lot of time here. And then 
this place popped up on the market. It had been on the market for a long time and had been fallen into a little bit of a disarray. The owners were in Chicago and they were never really here. And there was a ton of work that needed to get done. And they were over it and, you know, were aging out. And so we just kind of like really worked on them and, uh, and got to where we needed to be and decided to sell our home in Arlington and, and make the move. Um, so that was a year ago this past month. Nice. Um, so now we've been here for, for a year. Congratulations, and, yeah, man. I'm thanks. happy for you. Thanks. It sounds like you really got together. But you got some – so I'm curious. So 2019 or going into 2020 has been a shitty year. I kind of feel like you got out of the industry just in time. <laughs> I mean, you must be looking at like, wow, I really like – where would I be right now if I stuck with it? You know, like yeah. I feel like you got out of it just in time. Um, but it looks like you're making some moves. I don't know exactly what's happening, but your Instagram, you're promoting things like the Red Barn Kitchen. You got healthy. Yep. You know, what is healthy living Vermont? Like, do you have some like side hustles you got going on? No, like- that's the main hustle right okay. now, actually. So, so Full Heart has been the main hustle. And then through the consulting process, I was talking to Healthy Living, which is a local, all natural um, uh, grocery. Okay. Um, store and uh, they've got a family of businesses one here in South Burlington one in Saratoga New York a new one coming in October and then who knows probably some more after that and uh, I was talking with them about their culinary program and what they're trying to accomplish out of their stores um, and you know they said well we want to kind of we want to go a whole new direction we want to start really focusing on house made food and you know, creating more of a culinary identity within the four walls of the store. Okay. And so... Are we talking about Red Barn Kitchen or Healthy Living? No, 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 Healthy Living. Okay, that's making sure. And so so I started working on that project with them, doing some consulting, and then it kind of just snowballed, and they said, well, what would it look to take this, uh, you know, this IP in-house? And I said, well, I could probably give you 10 hours a week, and then, you know, that kind of kept growing, and I talked to Jason, and I said, listen, in the time of a pandemic... I want to be home. I want to be in my community. I don't want to travel. You know, with Full Heart, I've been hopping on a lot of planes all over the place. Um, I said, I don't want to really do that right now. This feels like an awesome thing that's local. It feels really exciting. Um, and I want to give it a shot. And he's like, do your thing, man. He's like, you know, work. we'll continue to work together. You know, I, I have remained a part of Full Heart. And I will support Full Heart and Jason to the day I die. It's, you know, my baby. I began it. He's been uh, taking the charge operationally and creatively to really get it to its next place. But this was right here in my backyard. And uh, and so I started uh, a new opportunity that they created for me there, which is uh, VP of Culinary. Oh, nice. So um, it's great. I get to uh, help them navigate um, what the kind of next, you know, uh, evolution of their brand looks like from a culinary perspective. Um, I've just actually hired three of my former chefs from my restaurants nice. to move up to Vermont and start taking over there in their go. locations. And so we're going to, we're going to get after it. Nice, uh, it's man. really exciting. It's really exciting. I think there's an interview, a follow up interview on like three years on the horizon for the, the two of us. I'd oh, love to man, hear for ghost. sure. That'd yeah. Be great. Yeah. So I think the cool part now is like, it gets me out of the house. Like I'm back in it. Like I'm in the environment, like I'm in a food environment, right? Like I'm in a kitchen uh, we're R and doing, uh, excuse me, R and Ding, like exciting new recipes. We're building a whole new portfolio. We're launching new programs. I'm hiring a new team. Like it's just, it's exciting. It's the thrill of all those things that I love about the food industry, and like we're on the front lines, right? Like frontline workers, like essential workers, uh, in the time of a pandemic, providing food for people, you know, that that need it in their community, and that's like exciting for me. So, what do you think the future looks like? I'm, I'm as somebody who kind of climbed the ladder to the top, doing what they're doing um, within full service on, on the fine end of food. I mean, fine, mm, yeah. casual. Yeah. Um, what's broken, and what needs to change? And if you're opening a restaurant tomorrow with the the current state of the industry right um the the world we live in today how are you doing it different how am i doing it different um or well, right i should say well i mean i think still i think about just keeping it manageable for yourself um you know i think uh making sure you're not biting off more than you can chew um it's 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 a it's a it's a scary weird weird world out there right now with restaurants. Um, I I don't know that I'm the best one to speak in the COVID environment <laughs> of like because right. I don't have the experience of operating a restaurant in COVID, you know. So I don't really know. I know that like there's a whole nother level of anxiety right now uh, with restaurateurs and rightly so um, about you know being the able future. to s- serve safely in the future and you know. Um, I you know, I'm. Uh... 
I think there's way too much pressure on the restaurant tour right now to hold these standards. Yeah. And I think that it's unfair the government's putting this on the restaurant tour. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I deeply believe, I mean, I'm sure you have seen this via social and whatnot, like the industry needs assistance. Like, yeah, that's the bottom. That's the only line. way we're going to come out of it. You know, for sure, it needs assistance, and there needs to be some sort of bill passed that will help. Um, that will help restaurants and, or particularly the service and the hospitality industry. Um, you know, but it, it, real quick because you mentioned it, www.saverestaurants.com. Thank Just you very go much. to that link. Yeah. Click it. Yeah. A f- like a fields will populate. All you gotta do is enter your email address, your zip code, and a letter will be sent to your senator automated. That's yep. all you gotta do. Just I'm glad literally. You did that. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you for bringing it up. Um, and and reach out, right? And like you said, you know, your senator. I mean, it's about being in touch with with local um, policymakers and advocating for restaurants and advocating for the owners. Um, and and yet, I think the other piece of that that we are certainly watching happen in real time is like this is what restaurants were built for, right? Like the community that restaurants create, not just where they're located and for their guests, but like internally, like the industry people, um, all coming together to help each other and support each other and to find out what they can do. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of text threads I'm on from all over the country in different cities with different chefs. Right. And like, it's literally like, Hey, who's doing what for linen right now? Help me out with this. Like it's incredible to watch. Right. And like that camaraderie and that, um, that family, that familial approach to doing business is like so unique to hospitality. Yeah, and I think there's a shift happening in the industry in general because I feel like the industry traditionally was very closed off, very keep your secrets close to yeah, your chest. Yeah, yeah. Me against the guy down the street. Yep. And I think that's changing. And uh, yep. th- that's part of the mission of this podcast is to create that culture of guys. You're stronger together. You totally. know, uh, you're not all going to be the best at one thing, but together you all have something that you bring to the table and you can help each other out. You know. Yeah. Knowledge uh, is power. Absolutely. You know? man. Yeah. So, so I think that's really amazing to watch. And and just um, yeah, I think I think keeping it small, keeping it. I had a friend that once told me, and he's a restaurateur too. He's awesome. Um, he said, keep it small and keep it all, mm. you know? And I love that. It's such a great concept, right? Um, I mean, that's, you, you mentioned Red Barn Kitchen. I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing here. It's why we wanted this property is like, it has this amazing barn where I can, you know. So is this the Red Barn Kitchen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, that's you're that's on your property now? Yeah. So, so the goal was like, there is an existing kind of grandfather clause here where the previous owner was a cake decorator. Oh, so it's been a commercial kitchen. Nice. So uh, I'm just got to breathe some new life into it. But the long term goal is, uh, you know, to be able to still have my hands in food this way, too. And, and, you know, have everything that's happening in the barn coming from just down there. And is it going to be like a media situation or? Uh, no. I mean, we, well, we don't. So pre-COVID, the plan was uh, was catering, um, you know, events, uh, event specific. Uh, events are still totally, I think, one of the best options right now because as long as it's on private property. Right, right. You're sorry to derail you. No, no. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, I also would love eventually to work towards putting like 20 seats in there and doing some classes and workshops and Pop dinners and, and yeah, yeah. Some fun stuff like that. So who knows what, what, what it will become. But I think the goal for me is like it's here. I own it. It's containable. I can turn it off and turn on when I want. Um, and I can draw on, you know, the the gardens and the farm that we've been working on this it's summer. beautiful, to, man. Thanks. To, to kind of like this was all just like a, a test run this year. It was like what can we do? You know, let's just put stuff in the ground and see what happens. And now it's just a learning process. We know what the hell we're doing. You know, we're it. trying to figure it out. I'm ready for a speed round. But before we go there, this is something I'm asking all my guests. The, the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. Mm. How have you transformed over the past 20 years? Personally? Yeah. Um, I think that I, well, I, I would hope that I have continued to take myself less and less seriously. Um. You know, I, uh, I really want to make sure that like I bring joy, like it's a really important thing for me is, is not just finding joy, but like providing it to yes. other people, you know? And I think like we're in a moment right now where people really need joy. Absolutely, man. You know, they need joy in their life. So how, how are we going to, as, as people who are in hospitality, how do we create those opportunities? You know, we're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it? Factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success. 
Sense of urgency. Ooh, a sense of urgency. What is your biggest weakness? Um, well, I have so many. Um, <laughs> I would say my biggest weakness is probably overthinking. What's one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process? Uh, the fire in the eyes. Mm, I like it. What What do you mean the fire in the eyes? So I have this uh, just distinct belief that you can teach people the trade, but you can't teach them that level of passion and excitement for what they do. Mm. What's your biggest challenge today? I know you're not currently in a restaurant, but what's your biggest challenge today? Well, my biggest challenge today is getting uh, is what I'm my project. I'm currently immersed in a healthy living, which is literally shifting a culture. Um, it is it is changing uh, a place that has been in existence uh, since 1986 and shepherding them into a new philosophy on food. So that is if that's not enough. I don't know. I don't know what it What is. advice do you have for somebody who's shifting a culture? Because I feel like that's something that happens. A lot of people will come into a pre-existing culture. They see that the writing's on the wall that it's not right and that it needs to be changed. But how do you go about doing that? Oh man, it's uh, you know, f- in my current situation, it's uh, it's a lot of little steps. It's kind of taking things one at a time, and you know, being very transparent in the process. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't hide anything from our team. We talk about things a lot we talk about why things need to be done differently you know and uh why not everything can be cooked in a 350 degree oven all day long right for example (laughs) so so there's a lot of like teachable moments that i think uh you know just i think you said you hit the nail on the head with communication yeah communicating as much as possible you can't over communicate um share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team respect core core value respect great uh what's one common standard of service you teach your team so there's something that's common within the four walls of the restaurants you led but not common throughout the industry to go above and beyond one word i mean i would say empathy mm. share a uh, one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant operator oh man um setting the table what's your favorite part about that book i think my favorite part about that book is just the uh, incredible perspective that it gives you on what true hospitality means. I love it. Uh, what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? Listen, Mm. what is one service you've hired or outsourced to? So, uh, this is a service that wasn't in house, but it's, it's an extension of your team, like an outsourced service to your team. Marketer, PR, oh, HR. Yeah. Th- that w- was, sorry, what was, the, what was the intent of the question? Can you say it again? What is one piece? Yeah. Or sorry, what, what is one service that, yeah. that you've outsourced? PR. PR. Yeah. yeah. And do you have a specific person? The purpose of this question is to help good people connect with good people. Uh, um, no. <laughs> name one technology because well i have to but i have <laughs> okay. to give i have to give context to that yeah, and please 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 and it's because I, I i i don't know intrinsically in this moment in my life that i believe in pr and the pr people in my life are gonna hate hearing me I'm say that i'm happy you say that but i just don't know if i buy it right now <sighs> well when it comes to when it comes to like chefs and restaurateurs feeling like they need representation in in that landscape as a persona and as you know uh kind of a talent i just i just i for me personally this is just for me personally i don't know that i have a value there um so I kind of share that sentiment, I, and I, I should be careful too because I, I work with a lot of publicists to try yeah. to line up people on the show, but what does it say about our industry that like unless you have a publicist to be getting all this media, you can't That's make kind it. of my point. And I think now we like- And it's the same situation we said earlier, you know, like we, we painted ourselves into the situation where we need to do these things and- I don't agree with it all the time. Did I cut your train of thought? No, no, no. It's all good. I mean, I think we're on the same page. I think like, you know, I just think we all need, we're in a moment right now, right? Like this is a fucking moment. Like we have this opportunity to stand back and look at the world and be like, are what we doing or are, is, is, is what we're doing right now, you know, the correct thing for the industry. No, you know? but we're doing it to ourselves. And that's the thing. Cause we all think we need to do it. And that becomes the new standard, the new norm. Yeah. Well, wouldn't the new norm be awesome if it was more about like 
how we were judged by how engaged with our community exactly we were, man. We, were in, we were judged by how we mentor our teams okay. we were in, we were judged by you know uh, you know all of these sorts of things that have been backburnered for so long this is exactly why and I'll, I'll tell you more about this later but my listeners have been hearing and being earful of this this is why i started restaurant unstoppable network is because I'm sick of social media. I'm sick of Facebook. I don't want to go on social media and engage with strangers. I mean, I love everybody, but I, I don't give a fuck about you. I can't give a yeah. fuck about all these people. We're expected to give a fuck about thousands of people, and it's yeah. not possible. It's not humanly possible. We can only manage about 150 relationships in our life. That's what we're humanly evolved to manage. Yep. And we're expected to love everyone yeah. and to touch so many people at once. And it's not sustainable. It's not healthy. It's yeah. not good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Yeah, it's tough. But, you know, I, th- I think publicist PR, they do play a role for sure, particularly in times when we have to like, you know, there's crisis management or there's like whatever. Right. Like I get all that. But I just think for the sole purpose of trying to chase like accolades or awards or like television shows or like i don't know i just for me i'm just in a i mean look at this man what the fuck else do i need like yeah you got i'm in made. the woods like this is i don't care about anything else and maybe that's selfish but like i've found the happy place where i like operate well i can be a great husband a great dad a great worker you know for somebody and that's all I need. so much for a speed round <laughs> no <laughs> sorry no man i love it I, I if it was for me it was if it was up to me there wouldn't be well, it is up to me. It's not true. I like the speed round. Yeah. Uh, okay. Almost. We're almost done. What's one piece of technology you've adopted, or maybe you've coached one of your clients to adopt recently that's had a huge impact on their operation? Well, so we're. Uh, I'll tell you, dude. No, no holds barred. Galley. Mm. And if you're not familiar with it, you got to check it out. I am so drunk on this thing. It's like. Uh, what is Galley? Galley is a uh, recipe and inventory management system nice. for restaurants. Well, for food service. It is fantastic. I'm totally in love with it. I'm in love with the guys that started it. I love the whole program. Um, I've used it for a bunch of clients with full heart, and now I'm bringing it into healthy living, and I'm really excited about Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Galley, look out. You're about to get a few more, for a few more <laughs> customers. And um, this is the last question. It's a doozy, so get ready for it. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure. With the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind, for the good of humanity and for your legacy, what were those Jeez, three pieces dude, of wisdom? That's be? deep. We're getting, we're getting <laughs> deep on it. <laughs> I don't mess around, brother. Three pieces. Yeah, three things. Three things I want to be remembered for is you what know, you're saying. What this helps sometimes this uh, if I when people who I interview have kids. Yeah. What helps them is if I say, "What would you want to leave behind for your children?" Oh man. Well, I think I, I, the, for me they would be to be good to other people. One. Yeah. Um, to believe in your own ability. Two. Um, I don't know, man. Love hard. Three, man. Love I've hard. loved this conversation. Love hard. You've been a pleasure to speak with, man. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. That's how I find future yeah. guests in the show. You've been mentioned at least once or twice, I think. I'm pretty sure. Well, that's nice of people. Yeah. <laughs> so who do I you love re- you too, whoever you are. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. Who do you respect and admire and believe and make a great guest mentor? So like you know who I is? love? Um, just because I think of like the aforementioned like three things and, and also just the killer chef on top of it but like great spirit and like just hungry to wake up and like live her most authentic self every day and that's karen akonowitz karen akonowitz i yeah from the the fox yep fox and the knife fox and the knife yep karen she was a past guest on the show she and was. i agree with you okay. and I, I would have to get her back on the show because it's been at least two years so yeah another three years she'll be due for uh, what's what's new yeah she's she's awesome i just love watching her kind of trajectory yeah and like her just uh you know no fucks to give just living her living her life yeah. and cooking great food and inspiring teams when and, i had her on it was just before she opened so it would be cool to get her back on the show yeah. to find out how that's yeah. going uh karen look out i'm coming after you and let the <laughs> folks at home know how can we connect with you or if you want to follow what you're up to what's the best way to follow you uh, well, so, you know, aside from all the social media bashing we've been doing tonight, I guess I would love to have people follow along, <laughs> <laughs> right? The, there we go again. It's the uh, it's, it's the six, it's the, it's the, it's the challenging circle we live in. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at Matthew Jennings, um, and Twitter as well at Matthew Jennings. I'm not on Facebook. Um, but you can also just find me by, uh, you know, strolling into healthy living. 
Beautiful. Uh, and again, I just can't say thank you enough for coming on the show. There is no questioning, my man. You are unstoppable. We'll cut Thanks, it there. Bro.